Uh, the goal for this bridge event is to share with you some research findings and some information about some programs that are related to rural youth as they make their transition into college and careers and their adult life. And so uh, we have three presenters who will be sharing with us today. We have uh, Dr. Judith Meath, who is the lead researcher at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We have Rhonda Townsend, who's an assistant superintendent in Seminole, Oklahoma, and Debbie Crawford, who is the assistant superintendent in Hawkins ISD in Texas. Then uh, some of my colleagues here at the Regional Education Laboratory, Heidi Williams and Veronica Ruiz de Castilla, will be facilitating questions that you pose in the uh, question chat pod once that is uh, presented so that you can ask those questions. So I wanted to give you a little bit of information um, about our first presenter, Dr. Judith Meese. She is an award-winning professor from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She was the principal investigator for the Rural High School Aspiration Study, which was conducted from 2007 to 2011. And this research uh, was conducted by the National Research Center on rural education support that, like the Regional Education Laboratory, was uh, funded by the Institute of Education Sciences. She's currently doing a follow-up study of 7,500 rural students in their post-secondary years. Uh, Dr. Meese has authored and co-authored numerous research briefs and peer-reviewed articles on the subject of rural youth. She began her career, however, as a, a, a preschool teacher, and she's gone from there to becoming a professor in educational psychology at the University of North Carolina in the School of Education. Uh, in addition, Dr. Meese co-authored a textbook, the first textbook for educators, on the subject of child and adolescent development. And the title of that is Child and Adolescent Development for Educators, and that's now in its third edition. She also co-edited with Jacqueline Eccles the first handbook that focused on schools as a developmental context. And that book is titled The Handbook of School, Schooling, and Human Development. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, yield the floor uh, and turn this over to Dr. Meese so that she can share the results of her work and her study with you. Thank you, Vicki, for that welcoming introduction. And it's a pleasure to share with this audience the Center's research on rural high schools. I'm going to begin by giving a little background about the Rural High School Aspiration Study, then share the results from the study and their implications for educators, researchers, and policymakers. To begin, the study was part of the National Re Research Center on Rural Education Support at the University of North Carolina. The center was established in 2004 with funding from the Institute of Education Sciences of the U.S. Department of Education. And its mission was to provide professional development and research to address significant issues facing rural schools, educators, and communities. The study that I'm going to describe took place during uh, between 2007 in 2011. The study was intended to provide new knowledge of the current status of rural high school students, their plans for the future, and their preparation for careers in college after high school. Over the last decades, there has been significant economic and social changes in rural communities. From research in the 1980s, we know that rural youth were less likely than urban and suburban youth to attend and complete college. Yet few studies on a national scale have examined the post-secondary goals and ambitions of rural youth in the early 21st century. From prior re research, we know that rural high schools face a number of challenges in preparing youth for the transition to careers or college. 
First, as this slide shows, rates of poverty tend to be as high and in some regions higher in rural than urban communities. These data are from the Educational Longitudinal Study of 2007. Rural poverty tends to be severe, long, long-lasting, and intergenerational. For rural schools with limited resources, it's a challenge to meet the needs of low-income students. Superintendent Townsend will speak to this issue in her presentation. In addition, rural youth are less likely than urban or suburban youth to have parents with a college education. This slide is also from the National Education Longitudinal Study of 2002. As you can see, there have been changes in the educational levels of rural adults, but most studies continue to report lower levels of parental education in rural areas. Parents who have not attended college have less knowledge of the pathway to college, and they, have, and they tend to hold low educational expectations for their children because they did not attend college. Some of these parents also hold a narrow view of what opportunities are available for young people today. Superintendent Hawkins will speak to this issue in her presentation. Many rural high schools experience difficult difficulty in recruiting and retaining qualified teachers for advanced courses in mathematics, science, and foreign language. Similarly, teachers to serve youth with disabilities are in short supply in some rural communities. And also, due to budget shortfalls and a need to increase college preparatory programs, there have been sharp declines in the vocational and agricultural programs for youth not planning to attend college. This slide shows the provision of dual credit in eight advanced placement programs in high schools by geographical location for the year of the rural high school study. Dual credit programs are when a high school student begins to take college courses while completing high school. For rural students, these college courses are typically offered online. However, as you can see, rural students lag behind their urban peers in terms of access to these courses. In summary, many of the challenges rural youth face are due to geographical isolation and limited economic resources. Also, to pursue educational and vocational opportunities, rural youth often leave their communities to seek these opportunities elsewhere. And this outmigration of youth is a significant concern for many rural communities. Although rural youth face numerous challenges, it is also important to point out that rural schools have some unique assets that benefit youth's academic achievement and adjustment and development. And some of these important assets are listed on this slide. In 2006, the center received a grant from the Institute of Education Sciences to conduct a large-scale study of rural youth and their schools. It was one of the first large-scale studies exclusively focused on rural schools across the United States. The overall purpose of the study was to examine the impact of geographic location, community characteristics, economic status, cultural and ethnic background, family background, and school experiences on rural students' aspirations for the future and their preparatory activities. To select the schools, we drew on a sample of rural schools in the 2004 Common Core data of the National Center of Education Statistics. The schools were randomly selected based on rural and small town geographic codes. We also included schools that were eligible for the rural achievement programs, the rural low income school program, and the small rural school achievement program. We contacted a total of 114 rural schools across the United States, and 73 of these schools agreed to participate in the study. The main reason for declining to participate was that the school was already committed to several other initiatives. This slide shows the distribution of the schools across geographic location and the characteristics of the schools. So as you can see, the schools were diverse in terms of size, socioeconomic status, and their ethnic composition. From this slide, you can see 
uh, where the schools were located across different regions of the United States. And the colors represent different locale codes or schools eligible for one of the rural school achievement programs. And here you can see also that several of the schools were located in the Southwest. The primary data collection took place during the 2007-2008 academic year, the year that the Great Recession began. Given the large number of schools and students, teachers, students, administrators, uh, and their parents completed surveys that were administrated, uh, administered on site by a research team. Surveys with parents, however, were conducted by phone. Turning to the results of the study, I'm going to primarily focus on the student surveys. These findings have been disseminated through conferences, journal articles, and webinars like this one. There are also research briefs available on the NRC RES website, and I'll share with you again that website link at the end of this presentation. One of the questions on the survey ask students to report how far in school would you most like to go. The results show that approximately 36 of the respondents aspired to a college degree and another 34 to 36 aspired to an advanced degree. The responses of the youth in our most remote communities were only slightly different from the total sample. We also asked high school students on our study about their desired vocation at age 30. Their responses were coded for the minimal level of education required. Again, the results indicated that a majority of the careers mentioned required a college or post-secondary or postgraduate degree. Turning to preparation activities, the student survey asked students to report on their high school program. This slide shows responses by grade level. A majority of the students reported they were enrolled in a general high school program. About 16% of the youth reported they were enrolled in a college preparatory program at the time of the survey. When we broke down the data, to examine only those students aspiring to a college degree, we found that only 20% of the youth were enrolled in a college preparatory program. Thus, our data raised concerns regarding the academic preparation of youth who plan to attend college. We also asked students about the frequency of their engagement in post-secondary preparation activities like visiting college campuses. The items shown on this slide were generated from guides to prepare youth for college. In general, we found that participation in these activities were fairly low across grades 9 to 12. The students indicated that they relied on their teachers, parents, and friends for information about colleges and admission procedures. For youth making the transition to the workforce, we found a similar pattern. When we examined students' participation in career exploration activities, like job mentoring, internships, and work-to-school programs, we also found limited participation in these types of activities. Also, we found some interesting differences related to gender and ethnic diversity. The results are shown on this slide. Although the same proportion of girls and boys expected to complete college, more girls and boys expected to obtain a professional degree beyond a master's degree. There were few differences in the educational aspirations of youth across ethnic and racial groups, but ethnic minority youth were less likely to be enrolled in college preparatory programs or to participate in a college transition program. We also examined differences related to exceptionality status. About 10% of our students who completed the survey were receiving special services for a disability. This information was obtained from a 
the teacher survey completed for individual students. The majority of these students were receiving services for a learning disability. On this slide, you can see that a large number of the youth with disabilities plan to continue their education beyond high school. However, this slide indicates that students with disabilities had limited access to academic programs and activities that would prepare them for the transition to careers or college. In fact, 25% indicated they were unsure of which high school program they were enrolled in at the time of the survey. These results have some important implications for rural high schools to prepare these youth for the transition to, to careers and college. To summarize, the results of our study show that only a small percent of high school of the, our high school sample expected to discontinue their education after high school. Majority expected to continue their education beyond high school and possibly beyond college. There were important differences related to gender, ethnicity, exceptionality, and other background characteristics, but few, different, few differences across geographical locale. In terms of preparation, we found that less than one-third of the students were enrolled in college preparatory programs, and these programs were limited in terms of the types of advanced courses offered. We found that students with disabilities were less likely than their non-disabled peers to participate in post-secondary preparation activities. A limitation of our study is that it was collected that it collected educational aspirations data at one point in time. A question could be raised as to whether or not the, the youth surveyed will actually achieve their goals. We are now examining this question in a follow-up study of the rural high school youth funded by the Spencer Foundation. However, for a couple of our papers during the original grant period, we analyzed data from the National Educational Longitudinal Study of 1988. This data set has the most recent data on youth in the post-secondary years. As you can see from this slide, grade 12 aspirations for college among rural and urban youth and the proportion of those youth who actually completed college 10 years after high school. So th these are students that reported their aspirations at grade 12 and they were followed into the post-secondary years and how many of those youth actually completed their college education 10 years after high school. Rural youth were less likely than urban youth to graduate from college within this 10-year period. A major predictor of college success among rural youth were the rigorous academic preparation that they had received in high school. Taken together, the research has several important implications for researchers, education, ed educators, and policy makers. For rural youth, educational aspirations and college attendance rates are increasing. However, rural youth face challenges in college that secondary, that secondary and tertiary institutions need to attend. Many are not may not be receiving the rigorous academic preparation needed to be successful in college. If students do not plan or cannot afford to attend college, they'd appear to have limited access to information about other post-secondary opportunities. Due to economic declines in rural areas, many rural youth are preparing to leave their communities based on limited employment opportunities. It is not clear how well rural youth are prepared to succeed in communities away from their, their home communities. Furthermore, numerous studies have documented the effects of youth outmigration on the vitality of rural youth due to limited economic and vocational opportunities in their community. Thank you so much. I'll be, I'll, I am prepared to take questions at this time. Uh, we had another question. Uh, there was very few students that took AP courses. Uh, did you find it was because there were few offering the courses, lack of teachers, or did you find out any causalities there? That was one of the challenges for the, the high schools um, as of the funding situations in many of the high schools they were only they were off they were able to offer 
advanced placement courses through online platforms only. There were very few face-to-face -face AP courses in the high schools that we visited. And currently, the research on uh, taking AP courses in high school through online platforms is very uh, limited, and we do not know the effectiveness of those types of programs for preparing students to be successful in college. Okay, we, we had another question pop through. Why do you think there are so few apprenticeship programs available? That's a very good question. I, uh, we have done some focus groups, and there's a lot of variability across communities. I should point that out. We're, we're treating it as rural, as if all these communities are the same. So in some communities, there were opportunities to work in the community newspaper, work with a, in the community newspaper, or work if there was a business um, in the in the town to work, uh, have a business internship, or to work uh, in some cooperative education programs that were uh, near the community. But for the most part, we were quite surprised that the students indicated they had very few of these opportunities. I think that would be a good question for the superintendents to address. OK, I think we've got time for one more question. We're get, getting quite a few, but let me uh, ask you this one. Did you learn anything about the transition from the two-year community colleges into four-year institutions? That's a very good question. We're, we're looking at that now with our new data, our follow-up data. Uh, so we, we are seeing some very interesting pathways that these students take. That they, they the, the literature suggests that many rural youth will begin college in a community or regional college and then transfer into a four-year institution. But we're finding uh, that students may go to a four-year institution and then go back to a regional college and then go back to four years. So it's, it's very interesting, the, the patterns that we're seeing uh, in, the, in the new data that we have uh, to look at the, the follow-up into the post-secondary years. I think it's also important to note that we did catch these students right before the Great Recession. So we're very curious as to what happened to um, their aspirations as a result of the economic changes that took place in 2008 to 2010. Okay, I'm going to slip in. We've got just one minute that we can add another question. Uh, do you have any insights as to why the aspirations may be lower for Native American students? That's also a very interesting question. I, I, will be interesting to hear Superintendent Townsend's ideas on, uh, on the Native Americans. We were not able to do focus groups to go back out and, and to explore some of these questions more with the Native Americans. Uh, but we, we did go to one Native American reservation. And there we had a lot of uh, support from the school personnel. And they shared a great deal about the their students. And what I uh, inferred from the, the conversations there was that the reservation, um, there is a lot of benefits for staying on the, the reservation. Um, and so they uh, are less likely to, to leave uh, uh, the reservation. And uh, if they do, uh, what this one uh, superintendent uh, did with her uh, young people was to encourage them to go off and to get a college degree and to be a teacher or to be a healthcare worker and then come back to the reservation and work in their healthcare clinics or their schools on the reservation. Oh, thank you. That was a perfect segue to our next presenter. We have many more questions and everyone keep typing them in and we will send them over to the appropriate presenter and you will be answered. Uh, we'll catch some at the end of this after our next two presentations as well.